Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the Brookings Institution. And to those watching the, the event via webcast, you too are most welcome to join us. My name is Jeff Feltman. I am a John C. Whitehead Visiting Fellow in International Diplomacy here at the Brookings Institution. Um, and it's a real honor and pleasure for me to welcome you this morning on behalf of the institution and, and on behalf of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies to a Batkin International Leaders Forum on Climate Threat and Climate Justice. For six years now, the Batkin Forum has served as Brookings' most visible platform for engaging global leaders, including, most recently, Estonian President um, Karsti um, Kalulaid. I'd also like to, to offer my sincere gratitude on behalf of this institution to Alan and Jane Batkin for their tremendous support of this leadership series and for making events like this possible. I also want to recognize in our audience today that we have 16 Harvard students who are here for a workshop in Washington on European politics, democracy, and political theory. Welcome to you and welcome to everybody. Now, on my behalf, it's a pleasure at a personal level, not only an institutional level, to welcome today's two guests of honor, both of whom I had the pleasure of, of, working, of working with at the United Nations, one of whom is my former boss at the United Nations, and that is former United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and former President of Ireland, Mary Robinson. Secretary General Ban is now the vice, the vice chair of the elders, and he served as two consecutive terms as Secretary General of the United Nations between 2007 and 2016. I had the privilege of working for him during most of his second term as Secretary General, and I can attest to the fact that he personifies the principles of the UN Charter and the integrity that we would expect in the leadership position like this. Prior to his time at the UN, he had a distinguished career in public service in South Korea for 37 years, which included serving as the foreign minister of Korea, South Korea between 2004 and 2006. Throughout his tenure as the UN Secretary General, in addition to all the peace and security and other issues that he was, he was working on, he focused on bringing climate change to the top of the global agenda. Starting with the 2007 Climate Change Summit, he has led diplomatic efforts to tackle these issues. And he continues to advocate for mitigating the effects of climate change and promoting sustainable development. He helped launch the Global Commission on Adaptation in 2018, and he's been working as the president of the assembly and the chair of the Council of Global Green Growth Institute, the GGGI. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, welcome. President Robinson was, was, is the chair of the elders, and she was president of Ireland between 1990 and 1997, the first woman to hold that position. She also served as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights between 1997 and 2002. As the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mrs. Robinson witnessed the injustice in climate change and its disproportionate impact on the people of developing countries, especially women. She has since established a foundation focused on climate justice, and she served as the Secretary General's Special Envoy on Climate Change from 2014 to 2015. I had the privilege of witnessing her personal diplomacy in action when she also served as the Secretary, Secretary General Bansky Moon's Special Envoy for the Great Lakes region of Africa, where she worked to put together mechanisms to bring the, the regional actors and domestic actors together to promote peace in the Eastern, Congo, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. In a few short moments, Secretary General Ban and President Robinson will share their remarks on the climate threat, the climate justice, and the role of global leadership as it relates to action on sustainable development. Their remarks will be followed by a discussion moderated by our own Dr. Jun Pak, who is the senior fellow in the Center for East Asia Policy Studies and our SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korea Studies. Jung hosted just recently a tremendous conference last, last month on climate change in Asia as part of the Asia Transnational Threats Forum series. And as one quick reminder, as the, you know, as the cameras would indicate, this, this event is on the record and it is being live, live webcast. And you can tweet about the event using hashtag climate leadership. I will now, it's now a real privilege to turn over the floor, the podium to my former boss, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Secretary General, the podium is yours and so is the audience.
Uh, thank you, Ambassador Jeffrey Feltman, uh, for your very kind, kind words of introduction. I'm uh, very pleased to meet uh, my former colleagues at the United Nations and also Ambassador Whitman here. And I'd like to also recognize uh, uh, Chair of Korea Studies, uh, Dr. Jung Park, and of course, uh, uh, my chairperson of the elders, uh, President Mary Robinson, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back to uh, Washington, D.C., and also have an opportunity of uh, speaking before you uh, in the Brookings uh, institutions, uh, such uh, highest level uh, known uh, global think tank. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today, uh, delivering a speech uh, at the Brookings Institution, the world's foremost think tank, is always a great honor uh, for me. Uh, now, as a private citizen, I used to be here as a Secretary General and also Foreign Minister of the uh, Republic of Korea. Uh, today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, discuss with you uh, one of the two uh, existential uh, threats which humankind uh, is uh, facing and is going to face uh, very seriously. That is, one is what I'm going to discuss with you, climate change, and the other is a nuclear uh, possibility of a nuclear war, uh, on, on which, as was introduced today, uh, that I was honored to unveil the doomsday clock, uh, whose hand is now moved to... Uh, <clears throat> just 100 seconds before, before it reaches midnight, midnight. <clears throat> uh, that is the closest ever in the history uh, to the possibility of uh, a doomsday. Many scientists stress, in fact, uh, the reason behind unprecedented scale and destructiveness of uh, Australian fires uh, this is a bushfire, but this has uh, clearly very closely related uh, to a climate uh, crisis which we are now facing. So it is not an unusual one, it's an unusually serious one. As everybody will remember, in 2018, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has again strongly warned uh, to the world that unless we drastically contain the global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius, then there will be no hope. Uh, in fact, as you may remember, the Paris Climate Change Agreement agreed at two degrees Celsius. But soon, after four days, four years, after four years, uh, three years, they realized that two degrees was not enough. So IPCC has made a special, special report. In fact, during the time of um, <clears throat> negotiation in uh, Copenhagen and the continuing negotiations until Paris, there was a strong argument that this agreement should be at 1.5 degrees. There were many heads of state and government and ministers coming from small island developing countries. They were even crying at the decision of two degrees. But that was the maximum at the time. The world leaders were able to agree upon. So we agreed to be more practical and Understanding the reality of uh, some different different views and positions of the countries, now we realize that it must be completed and contained at 1.5 degrees. If we fail to miss all this kind of uh, some uh, golden opportunity, I think this may be almost the last opportunity that uh, we can live with this. Otherwise, if we just neglect accelerating our actions much, much harder, then you will have to regret for all our succeeding uh, generations. 
In that regard, um, as a former Secretary General of the United Nations and as a person who has spent the 10 years passionately uh, energizing and really um, trying to raising, uh, raise the awareness on the importance of addressing this uh, climate change issues, I cannot but express my deepest uh, concern that what is happening by the world leaders. Uh, we have to really do much, 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 much more. As part of the mandate, as you know, in 2015, there were two very important uh, visions and agreement which were presented by the United Nations. One is the uh, Sustainable Development Goals with the 17, 17 goals, uh, targeting by 2030. Then by 2030, there should be nobody who should suffer from abject poverty. And there should be nobody who should die needlessly from preventable diseases. And there should be no school children who should be left out of the schools. There are many, many issues and many uh, promises, but I think this is the most uh, ambitious and far-reaching uh, visions that the United Nations has ever presented to the people of the world. Then it contains the climate change. One of the 17 goals include number 13 pillar, uh, climate change. That is what I am going to really focus today and raising again and again the importance of this. I believe that, uh, again, uh, speaking in Washington, D.C., center of uh, United States, and just a year to uh, a White House, I cannot but express my deepest um, uh, regret and even anger about what President Trump has decided to withdraw from this uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement. This was signed by 197 state parties, four countries more than full member state of the United States. It has gone through very difficult United States was the champion under President Obama uh, to mobilize a uni sense of unity, to working together with the China, who was uh, reluctant, reluctant to join. But with my engagement and President Obama's uh, political, uh, political engagement, China and India uh, decided to join this one. That is the reason why we are now having this uh, Paris Agreement. I cannot, I can just uh, say, tell you that what President Trump has uh, decided is uh, politically very short-sighted and morally wrong and morally irresponsible. Even economically, it doesn't make any sense. When it comes to science, it is uh, totally wrong. There is no such uh, skeptics. There is no such uh, deniers as there used to be. There used to be some skeptics, but there is absolutely no climate skeptics. It is happening, happening much, much faster. It is approaching to us. If the agreement fails and if we do not solve climate change, we will all be losers uh, in the end. And thus, I strongly urge President Trump and his administration to return to climate change agreement as soon as possible. That's the urge of international community. That's the wish of all citizens around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, there is another issue which is uh, very closely related with the climate change phenomena. Uh, that is air quality, air quality, uh, air pollution, particularly in matter. As you already know, particularly matter air pollution is a dangerous threat in itself, but also due to its a close relationship with the climate change. The minuscule size of particulate matter allows it to enter the human body with ease, causing various illnesses, such as respiratory disease, 
cardiovascular disease, a stroke, and even cancer. According to WHO, in particular, 92% of Asia Pacific population, roughly covering 4 billion people out of 7.5 globally, are already exposed to high levels of air pollution. No region, no nation is safe from the threats of particulate matter. Again, according to WHO, 7 million people are dying needlessly from this effect affected by air pollution. You go many Southeast Asian countries and the African countries, you cannot just breathe. Even in my Korea, Republic of Korea, South Korea, one of the OECD countries, it's very difficult to breathe. People have been abusing their privilege of nature. Just a rapid process of industrialization, just a day were running ahead, just for industrialization, without knowing that they were just abusing our privilege. Action against particular matter cannot be pursued without addressing climate change as two are like two sides of the same coin. Not only do they share similar emission sources, but they also influence and exacerbate each other. Joint action is an absolute must. In this regard, the United Nations uh, during its uh, General Assembly session in September last year, designated September 7th of every year as the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies, uh, which was, uh, in fact, proposed by the Korean president, uh, Moon Jae-in, uh, last year during the General Assembly. The International Day aims to raise solidarity for action against air pollution and climate change all together raising political momentum against the two global challenges. I am also looking into ways to raise awareness and particular uh, participation of all stakeholders uh, by collaborating in many international organizations like the Boao Forum, where I'm working as a chairman, and also uh, uh, partnering for Green Growth and Global Goals Summit P4G summit, which will be held in the Republic of Korea in June. Therefore, I ask for your interest and support so that the International Day of the Clean Air for Blue Skies can advance a global action and change against air pollution and climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd also like to emphasize that dealing with the climate change also includes adapting to a new way of life. The warming planet means that we can no longer maintain the way we live, the way we work, and the way we consume, and the way we produce. We have to change our behavioral pattern. It's not only industries where they emit the greenhouse gas emissions. It's not from our own lives, lifestyles, we also create a lot of uh, uh, problems, like a particular matter, fine dust issues. Therefore, it is very important that we have to take uh, very seriously to adapt to changing a situation. The adaptation, mitigation are two policy responses, but we have been spending more and more on only mitigation. It's very important to reduce the sources of greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time, we have to adapt. Adaptation, this has just 10 letters, but the word adaptation seems so simple, but actually encompasses a lot. For example, adaptation means planting drought resistant crops in the highland, uh, highland dry land, positioning trees along riverbanks, restoring mangrove uh, forest, 
redesign the way we build our cities, sustainable cities, reducing the deadly impact of soaring temperatures and establishing an effective early warning system. How to make sure that people are aware of the imminent danger that we have to establish a effective early warning system to save lives. All of this cannot be achieved without the support of collective action and adequate financial, practical, and innovatory resources. This is what led to the creation of a recently Global Commission on Adaptation. Now I'm raising the awareness of the importance of how to adapt to this situation. I'm now working as one of the co-chairs together with Bill Gates and with uh, uh, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva, who is now new managing director of IMF. Three of uh, co-chairing this, but I'm more involved in this because of their own responsibilities. Now, we are going to host a summit meeting uh, after the very successful Global Action Summit meeting at the United Nations in September, in October, on October 22nd, at the invitation of the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, we are going to meet there at the heads of state and government level. And there will be many important uh, international events, like an adaptation summit in Netherlands in October, then COP26 in Glasgow, uh, November uh, this year. Therefore, I'm asking all the leaders, government leaders, business leaders, uh, civil society leaders to take part in these two very important events where we will really show our solidarity and joint action to address climate change. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, just um, add some other important aspect of uh, this issue. Another way we can ensure adaptation at a systemic scale is through education. After having served 10 years as a Secretary General, and after having spoken to many world leaders, business, political, and civil society leaders, I have realized now that I have been speaking only to those people who know already, but these people have regularly been changed. Five years after present prime minister, they are gone. The new, body, new people come, then we have to repeat and repeat. It's very important that from now on that we have to educate our young generation who will really be leading this world with a more sense of global citizenship. It's extremely important that we educate young people possibly from elementary school, elementary, middle, and high school. By the time they take charge of their leadership, community leadership, global leadership, national leadership, they will be much better equipped with the global citizenship, aware of importance of living together with the environment. That's what I got inspiration from Greta Thunberg, 16-year-old girl. I saw her speaking out in front of 150 heads of state and government at the United Nations. She was speaking out, look, because of your empty words, my future, my dreams were taken away. I will not forgive you. I will not forgive you. This is what she was saying. This kind of messages have been spread, and I'm very glad to tell you that the, for the first time, the Italian government, Italian government has made it a rule, national rule, that all the school children from elementary, middle, high school will have to go through 33 hours education on environment. This is a national law. I have spoken to my president in Korea. I have met the 
Deputy Prime Minister and Education Minister, that South Korean government should make sure that change their curriculums. Then I'm asking Chinese and all this, wherever I visit, I'm meeting the ministers, that they should educate the people. There was one, as early in 1992, in the Earth, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, the young, young girl who was just 12 years old, Seven Kulis Suzuki, said that losing my future is not like losing an election. The political leaders may win and lose election, but they are not responsible. But those young people will have to be responsible for their own uh, future. Ladies and gentlemen, the rise of the climate youth movement has also made me realize that we need to provide green and climate-centered atmosphere for all these people. During my two terms as the UN Secretary General, I had spent a lot of time meeting with world leaders, political leaders, to discuss the ways to deter this. And I have visited almost all the places on the earth where I was able to see, witness myself, the impact of climate change. I visited Arctic North Pole four times. And one time, Antarctica. Have you ever seen any leader who has visited this North Pole and Arctic? I was sending out strong messages, standing on the Arctic ice, that ice is melting, glaciers are melting. Let us prevent uh, from this sea level rise, rising. This has been my all you know, messages. Ladies and gentlemen, let me, uh, let me uh, conclude. Um, I cannot stress how important it is for us to unite and pursue collective action. When faced with such daunting challenges, it is tempting to shift the blames to others and turn blind eyes to the problems. However, playing the blame games is never the answer. I blame the President Trump, but it's not blaming the, just for the sake of blaming. I'm just urging him to show his global, global leadership based on global vision as a global leader uh, of this world. It has already been more than one year. The IPCC has made such a warning statement. We have only 11 years to act. Before it is too late, we have to answer. Uh, me versus you mentality has no meaning in climate action. Remember that it should be us versus climate change. This decade will be the final decade again, where we can turn the tide against irreversible destruction of our change, climate. Ladies and gentlemen, again, the last April, last year April, I had an opportunity of meeting uh, Pope Francis uh, in Rome. And we were discussing the climate issues because he was very much devoted and committed to climate change. That he told me that uh, God always forgives. A human being sometimes forgives. Sometimes, nature never forgives. Nature never forgives. I think this is true. The nature goes its own way. They do not wait for humanity. We have to follow the voices and warning of nature before the natural rash hit us, like many things happening now. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, let's work together to make this world better by addressing and taking climate action before it is too late. Thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, students, thank you for your welcome, and it's a pleasure to be back in Brookings and an honour to address you in such distinguished company, not least my fellow elder, Ban Ki-moon. Uh, remember, as um, Jeff Feltman actually reminded us, he was my boss for three mandates in the United Nations, and now he's my deputy, and he's a very supportive deputy at that. Uh, I also have very happy memories of participating over a number of years at the annual Brookings Bloom Roundtable in Aspen, partly because the company is very good and we don't have to work too hard. We get the afternoons off and we can go for long walks in the Aspen Hills. These are momentous times. The political dynamics unfolding on Capitol Hill will have a profound impact on how the United States is governed, its place in the world, and its influence on global debates. But, as Ban Ki-moon has so eloquently outlined, the world faces a challenge far greater than any political machinations in any country. The climate crisis must be the top priority for all leaders in 2020. It's not hyperbole to say that the fate of humanity as a whole rests on decisions taken this year. Yesterday, Ban Ki-moon and I attended the unveiling of the doomsday clock. Its hands now stand, as he said, at 100 seconds to midnight, meaning that in the view of the eminent women and men of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, we are closer than we have ever been to catastrophe. And it was actually very good that the four scientists that spoke at that occasion spoke so clearly and communicated so well the message of why on nuclear we're in such a bad position. On climate, we're in such a difficult position. And we have these disruptive technologies that, and the undermining of science that is um, making it difficult to make good decisions. As the name suggests, the bulletin has historically been concerned with the threat of nuclear war. But the climate crisis is cited as the other existential threat facing our planet. Both demand urgent, sustained, responsible leadership and action and the time for talking is over. The science of the climate crisis makes it imperative that we implement in full the voluntary commitments of the 2030 Agenda with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the commitments in the Paris Climate Agreement. We need a bold new vision where every country, every city, and every corporation commits to being carbon neutral by 2050. We need a change of mindset to enable a just transition to clean energy in a way that allows us to stay at or below 1.5 degrees of warming. We need to put a proper price on carbon. Every country needs to take seriously the report of the Global Commission on Adaptation, which Ban Ki-moon was speaking about, and build resilience in communities for the new normal we are experiencing, an experience exemplified by the terrible bushfires in Australia. Every country needs to raise the level of its political ambition regarding the nationally determined contributions, climate plans, ahead of COP26 in Glasgow this November. And this has to include the United States, regardless of the policies of the current administration. Whilst I, too, continue to deplore President Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement as myopic and irresponsible, I've been heartened by the huge response from Americans of all backgrounds, from state governors and mayors to business leaders, labor unions, faith groups, women and youth activists who've declared that they are still in and are determined to push for real climate action. Indeed, I'm convinced that we will only generate the necessary momentum and political pressure on leaders if we combine a top-down and a bottom-up approach that brings together all key actors, from the young activists so powerfully exemplified by Greta Thunberg, Jamie Margolin, and Alexandria Bilisanoor, to central bankers and the heads of the world's top investment funds. The recent announcement by BlackRock CEO Larry Fink that the firm will no longer fund investments that, in quotes, present a high sustainability-related risk, including divesting 500 million US dollars from coal-related businesses, is an encouraging sign, as is the new climate special envoy role in March for Bank of England Governor Mark 
Carney. Last month, I attended the COP in Madrid, together with my fellow elder, Ricardo Lagos, former president of Chile. I met many young people there, and I was really struck by the fierce clarity of their arguments and their determination to secure their future, and the fact that they keep saying, don't listen to us, we're only children. Listen to the science. Over and over again, that's what they say. Listen to the science. We need their energy and their mobilization. But there's also another important pressure from the top down, from business and investment. And then with this bottom up and top down, who remains in the middle? Governments. It is governments who need to be squeezed because if we're not squeezing them, they're not going to move. They're going to continue with business as usual. They're going to continue to deny because the reality is elected representatives have very short-term horizons. They're thinking of the next election, which may be six months away or at the most five years away. And they don't want to take hard decisions because they want to get re-elected. And that's a problem all over the world. So we have to put the squeeze bottom up with a broad movement and top down with investment and business, which is on the right side of this issue. We need to see climate change as an intergenerational injustice, as well as a crisis whose burden is felt the most by the people who have least contributed to rising emissions. Some small island states will literally disappear unless the richer industrialized countries take much more radical and urgent action to keep temperature rises to 1.5 degrees, including a definitive and wholesale move away from fossil fuel use, exploration, and extraction. There's a big gender dimension because of the different social roles of women and men in many countries. Women are on the front lines and have to try to build resilience when their communities are affected, and women leaders need to step up more on this crisis. Failure to act will be a terrible stain on the world's conscience and will mean any future reference to justice or common endeavour will ring hollow for the millions impoverished and displaced by the climate catastrophe. This is why a multilateral approach is essential, where the leaders of the rich and powerful countries, such as the G20, take the lead, not only in a spirit of solidarity, but also from enlightened self-interest. The challenge now is to increase ambition which means keeping the G20 and its finance ministers closely connected to the UN's climate agenda. Nowhere is this more critical than the debate on fossil fuels. We've actually entered a new reality where fossil fuel companies are losing their legitimacy and social license to operate. If governments are to retain their own legitimacy and trust among citizens, this means they must end all fossil fuel subsidies in all forms, so coal and other hydrocarbons are kept in the ground and resources are invested instead in clean, renewable energy sources and green technologies. We need action to deliver a truly just transition so that regions and communities previously reliant on fossil fuel production for jobs and broader economic and social structures are not abandoned, that workers' rights and dignity are respected, and that new opportunities are provided through investment and education for current and future generations. We also need the fossil fuel and finance industries to make a firm and clear commitment to halt any and all plans for future fossil fuel extraction, whether through drilling, mining, fracking, or any other form, and to develop a comprehensive, transparent database of all existing fossil fuel assets and reserves. A publicly accessible registry, whether state or investor-owned, would enable all stakeholders to organize a new plan for an orderly wind-down of pending or proposed projects, a just transition, in other words. It would give clarity to investors who hold an extraordinary latent power to further the sustainability agenda and thus secure a long-term future for their own assets and investment strategies. There is, of course, an irony that this year's G20 presidency is held by Saudi Arabia, a state whose entire economy is based on fossil fuels. But I hope that this apparent dissonance will actually concentrate minds in all G20 states to work together to develop new sustainable economic and industrial models that are compatible with a net zero world. I actually know for a fact that 
Saudi Arabia can switch very rapidly to solar when it wants to. I was on the board of the King Abdullah University for Science and Technology for a number of years in Saudi Arabia. And it was a new university with a very, very big um, uh, endowment from the then king. And it had all the money in the world for whatever research it wanted. And what did it want? Research on solar. It bought the research from this country on solar. It has wonderful sun and it has very good sand for making the chips. So believe me, there will be no problem when the time comes. But meanwhile, there's profit to be made, profit to be made, as we know. So that's the problem. And this debate mustn't, must not just be restricted to the G20. We need an inclusive global mobilization with the United Nations playing a leading role. Um, a few weeks ago, I had the honor of addressing the UN Security Council as chair of the elders at a session on the future of the UN Charter, 75 years after the organization's founding. The Council should be a key player in shaping the new global mindset on climate justice and climate action, but unfortunately, it's seen by many as not being fit for purpose. Too many members, not least those with the special responsibility of holding permanent seats, treat it as a forum for advancing their own narrow interests rather than a means of addressing common challenges. So we have a challenge, and this year 2020 is absolutely key. From the East River to the Potomac and the shores beyond, a radical change is needed in 2020. As elders, we were actually mandated by Nelson Mandela to bring hope. And as Mandela put it succinctly, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.